صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى لك المظلوم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا لعن الله الظالمين لكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All say, how hard is it to have to die? A strange complaint to come from those who have had to live. Mark Twain. Yesterday we spoke about death, a discussion holistically about the one promised truth for all of us. And tonight, we'll be continuing the discussion on the journey to the grave. When I was studying in Lebanon, every Thursday night, my teacher, Sheikh Mustafa, he would sit us down, a group of us, and we would have a private discussion aside from the studies of the day that we have every single day. And there was one night that stuck with me and really impacted me. It was a night he was telling us about an activity that he held at the camp, a youth camp that he was overseeing. And he was with the youth and they were sitting down in the daytime, but he left them and he went to dig a grave on his own, about 100 meters, 200 meters away. He kept digging a hole until it looked like a grave. Then he came back to them and he told them about the grave. And when it was the night time, he asked each and every one of the Shabib that were there to carry each other on a stretcher as if they were walking in with a janaza to their grave. So they experience their death before they were to die. And so one by one, they would go onto this stretcher and then the boys would hold them on their shoulders. And as they would walk, one by one, they would all get scared before they reached the grave. It felt too real for them. A few of them, a handful, actually reached the hole. And one by one, they got into the grave and they would cover it. And there would be no light. And every single one that came out had a pale face. And Sheikh Mustafa then told us that he himself got into the grave and he swore that there is nothing in this world that makes him scared. He swore that he doesn't feel fear really from anything in this world. Can we just uh, lighten the microphone a little bit? Thank you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He swore that there is nothing in this world that truly makes him scared. 
But when he was in that grave and he felt so constricted and darkness, he truly felt fear. But he said he knew he was coming out this time. And see, I want you to imagine yourselves on the same journey. He knew that this time he was coming out of it. But that next time, when it was to happen for real, there would be no choice to come back. That this was just a practice run. But he got a taste of how it would feel, how it's going to feel for every single one in this room is going to go through that one day. When the angel of death comes to the person who has died, the narrations say that the dying person says, give me one more day so that I can go back and do good deeds before I come here. And he said, you wasted all your days. And then the dying person says, give me one more hour. And the angel of death says, you've wasted all your hours. Until the dying person is forced to accept the fact that this is the end. And so, the reason why we should remember death, going off of what we spoke about yesterday, is to have this relationship with it where we can accept it now. So we are not forced into this when the time comes without being ready for it. A nurse, I found this survey online where a nurse, she was nursing the dying people, the dying patients, and she made a list of five things, the five wishes that these people would have before they died. And so I wanted to share those five things with you. The most common five wishes that they have, the five regrets. And the first one was that I wish I'd had the courage to live a life for myself and not for others' expectations. So many times we don't live the dreams that we had set ourselves when we were younger. For choices made or choices not made. And on the deathbed, so many people regret all the things that they could have done that they didn't do. The second one was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Sometimes people on the treadmill of life, they miss that family time with their parents and their parents die without having spent much time with their children. Sometimes they don't watch their children grow up. Sometimes their marriage suffers because of how much they work. They'd be working so that they can supply their children with provision for their lives, but they work so hard that their relationships suffer. And on their deathbed, they realize that the relationships were counted and they have suffered. So they wish that they didn't work so hard. Number three was, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings with others. When sometimes we're not honest with each other because we are scared of what might happen. And so they regret this at the time of death. The fourth one was, I wish I stayed in touch with my friends. On the deathbed, so many of them want to see their friends that they haven't seen in years, but they can't be tracked down in time. So they can't find them. And they think of these friends that they spent so much of their time with when they were younger, and they wish that they would have kept in contact with them. And number five was, I wish I had let myself be happier. See, they realize that happiness is a choice. That if you choose to be miserable, you will be more miserable. Sure, there are circumstances in life that are difficult for us, but sometimes, even through all the painful circumstances, one can still be happy and feel blessed for what they have. So these people, this, this was a very common one, was one of the most common ones, the I wish I could be happier. These people that were dying, they would have these regrets. And there's a likely chance that when we're dying, we're going to have the same regrets. So these are good to know before we experience that. In Islam, when the dying person is reaching their final moments, they go into something called ihtidar. So they are faced towards the qibla, their feet towards the qibla, and they are faced there. And that's when the death is coming to them. So Imam Ali alayhi salam in Najul Balagha, he has a passage where he describes what exactly is happening in those final moments. And I wanted to read it for you because it's, it's that important. He goes into great detail about it. So he says, whatever they ignored has befallen them. So death is the thing that they ignored. Yesterday we spoke about how we 
perceive death and how we ignore it and leave it into the, in the back of our minds because we're so uncomfortable with it. So he says, whatever they have ignored has now befallen them. Separation from this world from which they took themselves safe has come to them. Whatever has befallen them cannot be described. Pangs of death and grief for losing this world have surrounded them because they're so attached to this world. So they are feeling so much grief now that they're leaving it. Consequently, their limbs become languid and their complexion changes. Then death increases its struggle over them. For some, it seems in between them and its power of speaking. Although he lies among his people looking with eyes, hearing with ears, with his full wits and intelligence. So he's still there, he understands everything that's going on. He can see you, but he can no longer speak. His tongue doesn't work anymore. If you have been there with someone who's dying, you see that they're so weak, they can't speak anymore, but they're looking at you. Sometimes they blink if you tell them, say yes, say no. They can still communicate, they know exactly what's going on, they're realizing this is death. So imagine that, you no longer have the means to communicate what you're feeling, but you know you're about to die. Your intelligence is still intact. He then thinks over how he has wasted his life. His ears and tongue will lose function. He would lie among his people, neither speaking or hearing. He would be rotating his glances among their faces and see their tongues move, but not, not hear their speaking. Then death would increase its sway over him, and his sight would be taken over. No longer can he see. And his spirit would depart from his body. He then becomes a carcass among his own people, who will feel loneliness from him and then move away from him. For a short period of time, your loved ones, they mourn over you, over your body whilst it's still in front of them. But when your body slowly starts to smell, to change color, no longer will they have the same affection towards the body. The body is no longer the person that they knew. They will move away. A few nights ago, we recounted the story of origin of the angel of death and how he came to be when he collected the dust from the earth. But the first time that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi the first time he met the angel of death was on the legendary journey of the Isra'u Ma'raj. The Prophet, as is stated in the Quran, he had a journey in which he went from Mecca to modern day Palestine in one night on a horse called the Buraq, on a creature, a horse-like creature called the Buraq. And people thought he was crazy about this. But another journey that happened, that was the Isra. Another journey that happened was the Ma'raj, when he went into the heavens. Whether it's the metaphysical heavens or into the physical sky, there's a difference of opinion. In any case, this is something that all Muslims have to believe in because it's in the Quran. It's not a, uh, just a story. And when he was on that journey and he visited the heavens, he was with Jibra'il and he would find all these different creatures. The guardian of hell, he would meet the prophets. But he saw one being sitting on his own and he looked like a sad bird. The prophet describes him looking like a sad bird. And he had a tablet in his hand. And he would look at the tablet and there were names on the tablet. And he would neither look nor right or left. Just look at the tablet. On this tablet, names appear and they disappear. And then the Prophet asked Jibra'il, who is this? And Jibra'il told him, this is Azrael, Malak al -Maut. And so the Prophet went to speak to him. And Azrael told him, glad tidings to you, Ya Muhammad, for I see from your Ummah good deeds on earth. And so the Prophet asked him, can you see everything? And Azrael said, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me permission to oversee the whole universe. I see everyone. As if the dunya is a coin in my hand. You know when they play with the coins in between the fingers? To the angel of death, this is the whole world. And I visit every single house five times a day. And I see the people crying for their loved ones and I say, don't cry. 
I'm coming back to take you as well. Why are you crying? So the Prophet, this was the first time he had met the angel of death. The angel of death oversees everything in this world as if it's just a coin in his hand. Salah ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And when the angel of death told him, he tells the people not to cry because he's coming to take them as well. That's something we can't handle. Because when we lose the people that we love, we can't help but cry. We can't help but feel this pain. In fact, sometimes the hardest part of death is not the fact that you know you're dying. It's the, the thought of living without those that you love so much. I mean, how many of us think about the days when we have to live without our parents or our brothers or our sisters or our spouses or our children? It's a very difficult thing to have to accept. And if you look back at how the prophets and the imma lived their lives, they had to go through this again and again. Imam Ali السلام, after everything he had been through, he had lost all his friends and his wife and all the oppression that he had faced for all those years. Finally, he takes the Khilafah and then they battled against him in Jamal and in Safin. And when he was fighting against Muawiyah, a man by the name of Ammar ibn Yasir, who had been there with Imam Ali السلام, from the very beginning, he was one of the first Muslims and he was one of the greatest Shia who had ever lived. He stuck with the Imam through all the oppression. And Ammar was in his 90s. He was close to his 90s when he was fighting against Muawiyah and he was finally martyred. And this is a man who, when he was killed, Imam Ali السلام, would walk in the streets and he would say, I miss my Ammar. So Imam Ali himself would grieve so painfully over those that he loved. He has this beautiful line of poetry when Ammar ibn Yasir, ibn Yasir had died and <coughs> Imam Ali alayhi salam speaks to death. He's now speaking to death. This death that sees the dunya as if it's a coin in its hand. He says, Allah ayyuha al-mawt ladhi laysa tariki Rahni taqad afnayta kulla khalili Raka khabiran billadheena uhibbuhum he says, I, death, you, you death who has not left me, who doesn't leave me, give me rest, for you have taken away all my friends. I see you choose the ones I love as if you are specifically going towards them. So this is Imam Ali al -Islam speaking to death and how he feels about death seizing the souls of his loved ones. And what does death say to us when our time comes? When the angel of death comes to take our souls, it says, قُمْ فَخْرُجْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الَّذِي عَمَّرْتَهَا إِلَى ذَلِكَ الَّذِي خَرَّبْتَهَا It says, rise and move from that place which you have built the dunya to that place which you have destroyed. It says this to the sinner. So the dunya, he built it up for himself. But he destroyed his akhirah in the process. And in contrast, he says to, to the believer, rise and move from the place you have destroyed to that place that you have built. But you see, look at the way he describes the dunya. So there is no more houses, cars, loved ones, no more titles, certificates, no more beauty, no more anything, nothing to hide behind anymore, it's all over. Khalas, it's finished. At that moment, it's done. And this is one of the reasons that at the moment of death, when you want to go back and you ask to go back, you can't. Even though you're realizing now the truth behind everything, the way Imam Ali -Islam said it. Your intelligence is still with you. It's everything is intact. But now you're seeing parts of the unseen world, then what good is it to your perfection if you want to be good now? The, the purpose that we're here is for our perfection. If you can already see everything, then it's no longer built on faith. So when Pharaoh is saying, now I believe in the Lord of Musa, it doesn't matter anymore. Just before you drown, you believe in the Lord of Musa. 
So there is a period of time where it does become too late. Sometimes it is too late. Those few moments before, those moments define us. In those moments, there's something that happens called Al-Adila. Where Shaitan comes to you in your weakest moments. Excuse me. He comes to you in your weakest moments and he tries to damage you on your weak spots. So if he sees there is some anger in you for something that you have gone through in life, he doesn't want you to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with gratitude and humility. He wants you to remember that time that you suffered, so you go to Allah with contempt and anger. He tries to get you. That's why there's a dua called dua al-adila that should be read while someone is in these moments while he's dying. And it speaks about ashhadu anna al-mawta haq wal jannata haq wal nar haq everything in all their imma so that the belief stays in his heart. So in this time of adila, the shaitan cannot get through into your weak spot. So you have to battle your entire life, discipline yourself your entire life, so that just for those final moments, you are not weak to succumb to Satan. It takes a lifetime of work for that battle that's going to happen right at the end. Right at the end, that battle is going to occur. But there's hope. There's differences. When the, when the angel of death is taking the soul, questions are called out. O oh, son of Adam, did the world kill you or did you kill the world? Did you abandon the world or did the world abandon you? Did you harvest the world or did the world harvest you? You know, in Uhud, when the Prophet had defeated the Mushrikeen, those who were dead, they set them up. And the Prophet started speaking to them. And he asked them, how have you found the promise of God? And then Umar ibn Khattab said to him, they can't hear you, they're dead. And the Prophet said to him, they hear me more than you can hear me. They hear me better than you do. Right, so they're still alive there. Everything is still sound, they know what's going on. Even when you pass the stage of death, when the soul is taken, you're still there, but now you have moved into a sensory world, which we're going to talk about. But there is hope, as I said. The Prophet says to Imam Ali السلام, that your followers will enjoy three things. You will be with them at the time that the soul is being taken from them. You will oversee it. And you will be with them in the grave when they're being asked questions, you will be there to feed them the answers. And when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be there to identify them. So that's the hope. And that's what gives me my only tranquility when it comes to death. Because the narration saying, Imam Ali says, everyone will see me at death. An unbeliever or a believer. Every single one will see me. And so if you were a pious person in life, you would see the Imam with his pious face and he would calm you down and ease you into what you're about to go through. Whereas if you were a person and who was an evil doer, then Imam Ali alayhi when he's angry, boy, he's angry. Right? Then you would see the face of Allah's anger. So there is hope. Then Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam asked, he said that the Prophet asked the angel of death when one of his friends passed away to please take it easy on my companion. And the angel of death said, I'm always lenient with your followers. With those who follow you, I'm lenient. So there's hope. And the angel of death himself, by the way, when he comes to us, those of us who were good, the angel of death looks beautiful. It's not an ugly, you know, you think of he's like a skeleton and he has the, the, the axe. Right, that's what you think of when you think of the angel of death. That's not how he looks like. But if you are an evil doer, he looks hideous. So subhanAllah, like we mentioned yesterday, all of this that we're about to go through, it's all about what's inside us. It all comes back to here. It's what you have created, really. And what you are is what you will see. So there is a scholar by the name of Ayatollah Khansari, who Imam Khomeini says about him, it's as if he was a masoom to him. And Ayatollah Khansari had abilities that he could break through the veils of the unseen. And he said that there was one time I saw the angel of death come to me and he looked beautiful. 
and he took seven steps towards me. And that's when I knew that I had seven days left to live. So there are people who see the angel of death as a beautiful being, not as a hideous one. So we should get out of this taboo of thinking of the angel of death as, as a Halloween costume. And now that the soul is taken away and it's just a lifeless body there, everything changes. The scariest thing about it all though, that pain that, that everyone talks about when the soul is taken out, that pain is connected to how much you are attached to this world. So if you already had a relationship with death and were able to let go and had a healthy relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this world and you took from it what you needed only, then you will not have such a difficult time when the soul is being taken, especially when Imam Ali alayhi salam is there overseeing it. But if you were attached, if you couldn't let go of this world, and you are a lover of this world and you are so into this dunya then how are you ever going to be able to leave it and that's why the scariest thing that you go through in the afterlife is the loss of identity who am I as soon as you leave the body then you don't know who you are anymore you think about it I mean I was born I was a few pounds when I was born and his name was Hassan Mecca and he used to cry when he wanted something. And then he was five years old and he was walking around and he went to school. And then he was 12 years old and he went to high school. Then he was 21 years old and he finished university. And he's 25 and he's here right now. But if someone came and told me, Hassan, for example, why did you shout at me when we were 10 years old, 15 years ago? If I want to go by the scientific way of it, where everything in my body changes every 9 to 10 years, completely, I'm a completely different weight, completely different looking being, I would say that wasn't me. But it's still Hassan. Right? You're still you. The same you that was this big is now this big. But what happens when this body is gone? Who am I? Who am I now? If you didn't associate your true self with your spirit and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, there was a time I was thinking again and again, who am I, who am I, who am I? Really, what am I? I mean, what is it that I do? I mean, is a policeman a policeman or is that just his job? When it's six o'clock and he goes home, is he still a policeman? No, he's a normal man at home. Policeman is just what he does. What you do isn't necessarily who you are. Right? Am I a student? What happens when I stop studying? What am I then? Who am I? And I remember those days, for some reason, every morning I was reading the same few pages of Surah Maryam again and again. And subhanAllah, I realized it a few days later on the third page of Surah Maryam. As I was reading it, the answer was right there. Right? When Sayyidina Maryam salam, she comes with the baby Nabi Isa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her don't speak, fast from speaking. And she comes in with the baby Then everyone's pointing at her and they can't believe it. How can you do this? How can you not be married and have a baby? And they were accusing her of hideous acts. And then Fasharat ilayh, she pointed to the baby and the baby speaks. Right? Nabi Isa alayhi salam, as a baby speaks, what are his first words, the first things that he says? Out of everything he could have said, Qala inni Abdullah. He said, I am the slave of God. And I thought, that's who I am. At least who I'm supposed to be. To be Abdullah is a big thing. But that's who I'm born to be, who we're all born to be. So Nabi Isa as a baby answered it for us. I have everything that he could have said. And so when the body is left and the spirit goes on and it loses its identity because its identity was always associated with only the body, then what does it do? Imagine not knowing who you are anymore. So you go into Barzakh, into this world, in a confused state. You don't know what's going on. By the way, it's makruh to put hot water 
to do ghusl on the body with hot water. It's makruh. Because you might burn the body. It doesn't matter if he's dead. The spirit still thinks that's him. The spirit still believes the body is him. You don't want to hurt the spirit and scare him. You have to ease it through. So it's makruh to even put hot water during the ghusl. And you see how the ghusl looks when the body is lifeless and it's so heavy and you have to move the arms and you move the legs. If you haven't seen those videos, go tonight on YouTube and watch them. See how the body is when it's dead. Lifeless, so heavy. Right, but the spirit doesn't know what's going on, completely confused. And it watches its own burial. And then they bring the body and they put it into the grave. No coffin. They put the kafan and they put it into the grave. And they start reminding it of the answers, of the questions that Munkar and Nakir are about to ask. I still remember when my grandmother passed away last year, we went to put her into the grave and my uncles, each one got into the grave, one by one, to say goodbye. And my father went in and I was the last one. And I went into the grave. And it's just me and my grandmother, she laid there in her kafan, facing the Qibla. And I looked at her and I thought, is this my data, the, the person who raised me? It doesn't, it doesn't feel that way. I mean, what's, what's she seeing right now? What's she going through right now? She's seeing all of this. So we just try to calm her down and ask Imam Hussain to be here, Imam Ali Alayhi to be here to ease her through what she's about to go through. So you remind her, Allah is your Lord. Muhammad is your Prophet. The Quran is your book. You want, they remind the dead person. But you know, even if you remind them and even if they memorize everything, if you guys right now memorize the names of the 12 Imams, memorize the answers to all the questions, when Munkar and Nakir come, if you were not truly a person who followed the answers, you can't say them. Because now you move from the world of sensory, this world, to the world of meaning. The world where meaning is manifested. Where everything you do here has a meaning in the real world, in the Barzakh. And that's the topic we're going to speak about tomorrow. What is this Barzakh world? And in this world now you see different creatures. You see some beautiful creatures and some ugly creatures, depending on who you were. And so if you were not truly a follower of Muhammad and they asked you who is your prophet, you can't say. Even if you were a Muslim and you prayed your whole life and he was not truly your prophet, it may be a lie. What if it was a lie? What if it was all for show? So you can't even say it. So it doesn't matter about what you memorize. You think you can like outsmart Munkar and Nakir. It's not going to happen. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. The second one for Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. Third one for Imam Hassan and Hassan alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And so, this, my brothers and sisters, is the journey to the grave. And as believers, there should be fear of this, but at the same time, we should also have this perspective of Fursatul liqa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opportunity of meeting Him. When you look at death as the opportunity to meet the one whom you love, who gives you peace and tranquility and gives you the happiness in your life, your whole life you've been yearning to go towards and your physical body has been holding you back this whole time and so you have been yearning, then this is an opportunity for you. This is liqa al-habib. This is meeting the one that you love. Right? This is a love relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even makes you strong when it comes to death. That you will, it's not a death wish. We don't wish for death. It's above that. It's wanting to meet God. So when the angel of death came to Abraham to take his soul, and Abraham was known as Khalilullah, the friend of God. And so Abraham told the angel of death, Angel of death, have you come to take my soul? And the angel says, yes. And so Abraham says, have you ever heard of a friend 
who takes the soul of another friend, as in Allah is my friend, why is he take, wanting to take my soul? And so the angel of death went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, did you just hear what your friend said? So Allah told the angel of death, go back to him and tell him, have you ever heard of a lover that does not want to meet his beloved? You are the one who loves me. Why would you want to halt the meeting? And so the angel of death told Abraham, and Abraham said, take me. Right? This love relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's liqa al-habib. There was a man, when it came to the battle of Uhud, there was a man named Amr ibn Jarmuh. And Amr was an old man. And he had four sons who wanted to fight with the Prophet against the mushrikeen who were coming to fight the Muslims. But he himself wanted to fight. And his sons told him, you don't have to fight. And his wife told him, you don't have to fight. And he went to the Prophet himself. And the Prophet told him, fighting isn't incumbent upon you. You are giving your sons. That's already enough of a sacrifice. But you know what he did? He went, he took his sword and shield and he faced the Qibla and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me martyrdom and don't send me back to my family. And so he went to fight. Rasulullah told them, leave him. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him martyrdom. So he went to fight and Allah gave him martyrdom. And when the time came, when they had to bring the bodies back to Medina, the Muslims won the war. And they had to bring the bodies back to Medina. They had Amr's body on a camel. And his wife was taking him. But when he was going to Medina, the camel stopped. It wouldn't go. And the wife didn't know why. So it went to the Prophet and asked. She went to the Prophet and asked him, Why isn't the camel going towards Medina? I want to bury my husband. And he said, Did your husband say anything before he went to fight? She said, yes, he went, he faced the Qibla and he asked Allah to give him martyrdom and not send him back. And the Prophet said, that's why. Because he prayed and those men like him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts their oath. So he wants to be buried in the battlefield. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Muhammad. Various stories we can go on with about this liqa al-habib, wanting to be with the beloved. This perspective, a different way of thinking of death. How a believer, a true believer thinks of death. When he has sakina in his heart because he wants to go meet his beloved. So when Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, had all the empires she wanted. Fir'aun has everything. And Asiya is there and she can have whatever she wants. And she prays to Allah, Rabbi ibni li andaka baytan fil jannah. My Lord, make for me a house near you in heaven. And the beauty of this ayah is bait in that time is not like a bait that we know here, a house. Bait is a small room. That's what she means by bait. And this is the wife of Pharaoh who had everything. So you think about your life and everything that you have and it pales in comparison. The equivalent of thousands and thousands of the nicest cars that you like. Right? She could have had all of that. She, she wants a bait, not just a bait, not just in Jannah, not just in heaven. Andaka. Near you, with you. A house with you is all I want. Thank you. A house with you is all I want. Again, the notions of Liqa al Habib are apparent. And again and again, Imam Ali alayhi salam, all the time, after the battles in Uhud. The Prophet told him, you're going to receive martyrdom. And after the battles, the Imam would come and he would complain to the Prophet, why wasn't I martyred in this battle? And the Prophet would say, don't you have patience? Imam Ali would say, it's not an issue of patience. And that's why when finally he was struck with the sword, he said, Fistu wa Rabbil Kaaba. By the Lord of the Kaaba, I have been victorious. Because finally now he was able to meet the Habib. And you know, one of the most beautiful stories that I find that most people don't know is the story of Mu'tah. And I'm, I'm sure that most people in this room have not heard of the story of Mu'tah. The story of Mu'tah is when the Prophet when he was in Medina, he was starting to send his messengers around to the kings and the emperors. And one of them 
the Romans, they killed his messenger, his ambassador. And that was a no-no back in those times in the Arabian Peninsula. You couldn't do that. That was an act of war. And so the Prophet organized an army. And in the army, some of his closest companions were in this army, an army of 3,000 warriors. And the leader of the army was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He was the leader, he was holding the flag. And they went to fight the Romans. And the Romans were how much? 12,000. So it was 12,000 versus 3,000 in Mu'ta. Mu'ta is in modern day Jordan. And there, Ja'far decided that they were not going to retreat. And they went to fight. And this fight is one of the saddest fights in Islamic history. Because in this fight, it was finished in about half an hour. Only 14 Muslims died. The rest of them ran away. The Muslims ran away from that fight. Only 14 went and fought and died. And Khalid ibn Walid, he was the one who retreated and the people retreated with him when he took the flag. But before that, Ja'far, the brother of Ali, the son of Abu Talib, is not any man. He led the army and he went to fight these men and he was surrounded by them. And see, now when you think about this family of the Prophet, it's not just what happened in Karbala. This family, this is the spirit that they had. They all had this Karbala'i spirit inside them. And so Ja'far went and they surrounded him. And he was on his horse and he saw the Muslims were scared. So you know what he did? He held on to his flag. He got off of his horse. And as a statement, as a statement, it's not something that is condoned in Islam to do. But as a statement to show that we are not running away from this battle, he cut off his horse's head. And he stood there so there's no way to run back. No way I'm going to retreat. And he stood there against the army. And they surrounded him and Sheikh Tushi narrates that he had over 50 wounds on his body, 25 of them on his face because he would not give his back to the enemy. And the way in which they killed him, when he was holding the banner, they cut off his right arm, then they cut off his left arm. Who does that remind you of? They cut off his right arm and his left arm. And he kept fighting. Until he was martyred. And he said martyrdom is like a cool drink. Just like when Qasim said that it's like sweeter than honey. Or when Imam Hussain said death to me, I see it how Yaqub longed for Yusuf. And then when this happened, the Prophet back in Medina said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And he went to his wife, Asma, and he told her that your husband has been martyred. And he told Sayyidina Fatima Zahra salam to make food and send it to his house. That's where we get that tradition from, by the way. We make food when someone dies, or we do these majalis and we have food on the soul of Aba Abdullah, for example. Sayyidina Fatima Zahra was the first one to do it for Ja'far. And so that's where he got the name Ja'far al-Tayyar, because they were going to give him wings in heaven. And so when Imam Zain al-Abideen salam remembers his uncle Jafar al-Tayyar, he also remembers with him his uncle Abu Fadl al-Abbas salam. And he says, May God have mercy on my uncle Abbas for he had sacrificed everything for his brother, even his arms. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now has given him emerald wings to fly with in heaven, just like Jafar al-Tayyar. So Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam, he emulated the same fierce energy that his uncle Jafar had emulated in Mu'ta. He did it in Karbala. And he went out in the same honorable and sacrificial way as his uncle. He said those famous words, لا أرهب الموت إذا الموت سقى. I will not run away from death if death comes to me until with your swords you bury me. What kind of man says that? I don't run away when death comes to me until with your swords you bury me. And so tonight I wanted to remember the story 
of Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi tayyibin al Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The friends of the Imam had all fallen The whole family had fallen in front of the eyes of Abu Abdullah They have been without water for three days their throats parched dry Abu Fadl al Abbas walks into the tents the children all run to him Amma Amma Al Atash Al Atash We are thirsty Uncle Abbas Abbas emulated the same personality as his father Ali. He held it all inside. Imam al Hussein hasn't given him permission to go and fight. Abu Father goes outside. Brother, I cannot take it anymore. I need to go and fight these kuffar. Please give me permission to go to the battlefield. Imam al Hussein says to him, Ya Abbas, if you go, what army will I have left? But, brothers and sisters, there was no more army. Abbas was the final one. Could that have meant that Imam al Hussein sees Abbas as his army? Abu Fadl insisted, and Imam al Hussein told him to go get the water. Abu Fadl al Abbas sees the look in Sukaina's face, wanting the water. He goes on to the battlefield with his flag in his hand. As the enemies approached him from front and from right and from left, he fought them all off one by one. They couldn't take it, they couldn't hold Abu Fadl back. Abu Fadl alayhi salam reached the riverbed. He picked up the water, he brought the water to his mouth and he threw it back down into the river. Ya nafs min ba'd al Hussein huni Oh myself, you are nothing without Hussein. How can I drink water when my Imam is thirsty? How can I drink when Sukaina is thirsty? No. He threw the water back down. And he brought the water container with his parched lips looking down. He took the water rim to take back to Sukaina, to take back to the children of the tent. As he got back up onto his horse with his flag in his hand. <laughs> With his flag in his hand, he 
hear it back to the tents. He sees the children waiting for him. So Kaina tells the other children, Uncle Abbas will bring the water back. As he makes his way back to the tents, he is ambushed from all sides. First, they crack out of the right arm of Abbas. Abu Fadil holds the flag in between his upper arm and his chest. And he has his water container in his hand. And he keeps going towards the tent. But they cut off the left arm of Abbas. And he takes the water container into his mouth and he keeps riding towards the tent. Ya Rabbi, just let me reach the tent. I don't care about my arms. Let me get the water to the children. At that moment, an arrow is sent forth and it pierces the water container and the arrow pierces the chest of Abbas and with the water gone, Abu Father doesn't know what to do anymore. How can he go back to the tents without the water? So he makes his way back to the river to take more water. But Abu Fadil, with what arms can you take water? Another arrow is shot forth into his eye. And he is hit with a rock on his head and he falls down. The flag is damaged from top to bottom. But the part where Abu Fadil had clinched onto the flag was the only part intact. He falls down and he calls out, Ya Hussein, Adrikni. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam rides forth to Abu Fadl, and all the kuffar run away from the battle scene. Imam al Hussein shouts to them, Cowards, where do you run when you have killed my brother and you have broken my back? comes towards Abu Fadil. Abu Fadil has blood running down his face. The blood gets into his eye. He says, oh man, please don't kill me here. Let me see my brother Hussein one last time. The Imam says, brother, don't you recognize me? It's me, Hussein. He takes the arrow out of his eye. He puts his head onto his lap. But Abu Fadl moves away and puts his head back onto the ground. Imam al Hussein brings his head back to his lap. Abu Fadl moves away once again. Imam al Hussein asks, My brother, why do you do this? Why? Abu Fadl says, Mawlai. He said, Don't call me Mawlai, call me brother. He said, If I put my head on your lap now, where will your head be after me? Where will you put your head? On whose lap? He said, I have one request, brother, please don't take me back to the tent. I am a 
ashamed of myself to see so okay now without the water. When Sayyidah Zayna came back to Medina, Umm al Banin, the mother of Abbas, asked her, I don't believe that they killed Abbas. I can't believe they killed someone like you. She asked Zainab, Zainab, when Abbas was fighting, was a sword in his hand? Zainab told her, no, he was fighting with a spear. She said, I knew it, because if he was fighting with a sword, no one could have stood up to him. No one could kill someone like you, Abbas, like that. Even till now, they tell me you are dead. I don't believe them. But when I know that they took Zainab without the Shador, then I know that you were there. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah na Allah na alimini la yawm liqiyamah.